So far in the course, we saw different kinds of topological states, such as integer quantum whole states, topological insulators, and uh, topological superconductors. What was common to all these states is that they can be realized with free fermions, with no interactions, even though we saw that many of their properties are actually robust even in the presence of uh, interparticle interactions. In this part, in part of the course, we're going to discuss a, a different a class of uh, topological states called topologically ordered states or topological order. And these states are special because they can all be, only be realized in the presence of strong interparticle interactions. Now, uh, you've already seen an example of such a topologically ordered state, namely the fractional quantum Hall state. And uh, in this part, we're going to go deeper into this topic. We're going to see more examples and uh, discuss the properties of such states more generally. So what is topological order? So we, uh, these are gapped many-body states in uh, two or more spatial dimensions. In this part of the course, we're going to focus on the two-dimensional uh, case. And uh, one of their defining characteristics is the presence of what we call fractional statistics. So what is fractional statistics? We have a plane, we have a 2D gapped system, and we can create excitations on top of this uh, a, a ground state. These excitations are particle-like uh, localized objects. We call them quasi-particles. And we cre can create a pair of such excitations at two different positions. They behave as identical particles. And we know in quantum mechanics, if you exchange the positions, for instance, of two identical particles, called here a one and two, you should get a, a, that the state returns to itself up to a phase. What's special about uh, a, top, a, a topologically ordered states that have fractional statistics is that this phase does not have to be neither zero nor pi. So these uh, excitations can behave uh, neither like fermions nor like bosons, we call such uh, a, a quasi-particles anions because they can have any f a type of uh, fractional statistics. A as you know, this is impossible in three spatial dimensions, but it is possible in two spatial dimensions. So if we exchange two of these particles, we get a phase U12, which does not have to be a zero or pi. There's another closely related property of topologically ordered states, which is the presence of a non-trivial ground state degeneracy that depends on the topology of the manifold that the system is placed on. For instance, if we use periodic boundary conditions, this is like placing our system on a torus, we'll find that rather than having a unique ground state, there are multiple degenerate ground states. And moreover, this uh, ground state degeneracy is topological in the sense that there's no local operator, or local measurement that can actually distinguish between the different states. So in this sense, the many body wave function actually senses a, the global topology of the system. Okay, and uh, a, the best way to illustrate this notion of topological order is through an example. And fortunately, there's a beautiful example uh, uh, written down by uh, uh, Alexei Kitaev, which is the so-called Toric code model, which is an exactly solvable model that we'll uh, uh, study in detail in this video. The Toric code model is defined on a square lattice. On every bond of the lattice, we place a spin half particle. So we have a spin half that can be up or down in some basis, say the, the Z basis. And the Hamiltonian of the system is very simple. It's composed of uh, a sum of two types of terms called AS and BP. The AS operator lives on stars. So on every vertex uh, of the square lattice, we have this, uh, this star. And the AS operator is simply the product of the sigma x operators of the four spins that live on the uh, corners of this, of this star. Similarly, the BP operator lives on plaquettes or squares, and it's defined as the product of the four sigma z operators of the four spins that live on the edges of this plaquette. And the nice thing about the Tory code model is that actually all the, these terms, all the ASs and BPs, commute with each other. So all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute. Why is that? It's easy to see that all the ASs commute among themselves because they only contain sigma x's and sigma x's commute. Similarly, all the BP's commute with each other. What's maybe a little bit less trivial is that the ASs uh, also commute with the BP's. Any AS commute with any BP. Why is that? If they don't share any site, suppose we take this plaquette and that star, then they commute, just because uh, sigma x's and sigma z's on different sites commute with each other. 
But even if they do share sites, suppose that we look at this plaquette and this star, they would share always an even number, and always, in fact, two sites. And uh, you can check that because of this, they would actually commute. Why is that? Because if you try to exchange AS and BP, you would pick up two minus signs, one from each pair of uh, a, a sigma X and sigma Z on the same site. This means that we can actually uh, diagonalize the problem very, very easily. So because of the fact that all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute, they can all be diagonalized at the same time. And the ground state is simply obtained by maximizing bo both AS and BP because of this overall minus sign. Because of the fact that both AS and BP both square to one, their eigenvalues are either plus one or minus one. And the ground state would be obtained by simply setting both AS equals one and BP equals one in the entire lattice. Now notice that uh, a, a, the AS and BP have well-defined values in the ground state, but if you look at an individual spin like this sigma Z, that actually does not commute with the Hamiltonian and that does not have a well-defined value in the ground state. So that would actually fluctuate from up to down. And the same goes also for any sigma X. So we, we've discussed the ground state of the Tori code. What about the excited states? So to create the excited states is also very easy. We simply violate the, the uh, uh, conditions of AS equals one or BP equals one on a star on a, or uh, on a plaquette. For instance, if we take one of the stars and uh, uh, take the state, which is an eigenstate of AS with eigenvalue minus one instead of one, we've created an excited state. The uh, excitation energy is equal to two in these units. And this excitation is called an E particle or E quasi particle or electric particle. The reason for the name is a nice a, analogy with a electromagnetism. It turns out that the Tori code realizes a Z2 version of, uh, a, of a gauge theory. And similarly, we can flip the eigenvalue of a BP on a certain plaquette from plus to minus one. That creates a different kind of uh, quasi-particle or, or excitation, which is called an M particle. So starting from the ground state, how do we actually create these excitations? So uh, what we can do, for instance, is apply a local operator at some point on this lattice. For example, suppose we start from the ground state and apply the sigma z operator on this uh, spin. What would happen? Because of the fact that uh, sigma z and sigma x anti-commute, we would actually flip the eigenvalue of the two neighboring stars. Rem uh, remember that the stars uh, the AS operator on, on the star is a product of the four sigma x's on that star, and uh, a, both of these stars here and there would actually anti-commute anti with the sigma z operator, so they would flip their sign. That means that applying a single sigma z operator actually creates two E particles. An E particle is, an, a, a, is uh, a, a local violation of the AS condition on that star. Now, we can apply that sigma z operator further on the, uh, on the neighboring site, and you can easily check that that would again flip the uh, eigenvalue of AS on these two stars. So it would uh, undo what the first op sigma z operator did on this star uh, and uh, return the eigenvalue of this AS to plus one, but it would uh, uh, create a new excitation with AS equals minus one on the neighboring star. So what that effectively did is just move that E particle by one lattice constant. Okay, so similarly, we can also create the M particles. This we would do by applying the sigma X operator instead of sigma Z. So sigma X anti-commutes with sigma Z. So if we apply a sigma X on this site, that would actually anti-commute with the two BP operators on the two neighboring plaquettes, and it would create a pair of M particles on these two plaquettes. And uh, we can then apply a sigma X on additional uh, sites. So we can apply a sigma X here. That would uh, undo the uh, uh, M excitation on this plaquette, but create a new excitation here. So effectively, it just moved that M particles from here to there, and so on. We can uh, uh, pull these two M particles apart. Here, we already see an interesting property of the Tori code model. We uh, cannot actually create a single excitation, either E or M, 
by applying a local operator. So we've, in both of these examples, we've applied the local operator and we created a pair of excitations, either E or M. And if, if we applied further local operators, we could uh, uh, pull this pair apart, but we could never create a single one locally out of the vacuum. This is actually not an accident. You, can, uh, you, uh, you actually cannot create a single one of these uh, excitations by any local operation. If you apply either sigma x or sigma z, you would create a pair of these particles. And if, if you apply additional uh, local operators, you would pull this pair of quasi-particles apart, but you would never create a single one. You can ask what happens if I apply a sigma y. I encourage you to uh, check it out. What you would actually get is that you would create a pair of m particles and also a pair of e particles nearby, just because uh, you can write sigma y as a product of sigma x and sigma z but you would not create a single quasi-particle. Now I want to ask, what happens if I uh, create a pair of these m particles, which I can do, and then pull them apart, but suppose that I, my system has periodic boundary conditions. So uh, this site and that site are actually identical. So I can pull this pair of m particles apart, push them all the way to the boundary, and let them meet from the other side. And uh, then they can actually annihilate each other. So uh, this is what's called a loop operator or a string operator. That operator would simply be a, a row of sigma x's applied on all of these spins all across the system. And the system has periodic boundary conditions. So this loop or string closes from the other side. If you think about the system with periodic boundary conditions as living on a torus, this loop operator is a loop that goes around one of the holes of the torus. Okay, so uh, this is called uh, the, uh, uh, the M loop. We'll denote this type of loop by X because it's going along the hor uh, uh, horizontal cycle of the torus. And the M here would label the type of particles that goes around that loop. In this case, we applied a string of sigma X operators that takes an M particle in a closed loop around the entire cycle. Okay, and uh, you can check that this XM uh, operator actually commutes with the Hamiltonian. So why does it commute with the Hamiltonian? If we just apply a single sigma X, it creates a pair of M particles that doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian. We've created some energy. We've increased the energy of the system. But if we keep applying these sigma X operators, that pushes the two M's around until they meet from the other side and then they actually annihilate. So uh, at the end, we get a ground state. We actually, uh, a, we returned to a ground state. Similarly, we can define a, a loop operator that is associated with the other type of particle, with the E particle. So uh, if, for instance, if we apply a, a sigma Z operator on this row of, uh, of sites that goes all along a, 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 a around the, the torus, that actually creates a pair of uh, E particles and moves them uh, around and then uh, uh, lets them meet from the other side and uh, uh, annihilate each other. We call this operator a Y E oper uh, operator. The Y is because uh, the loop is on a vertical cycle of the torus and E is uh, because it's, uh, it's creating and uh, uh, annihilating a pair of E particles. And similarly, you can check that uh, this operator commutes with the, with the uh, a, a underlying Hamiltonian. So we have this uh, set of loop operators, either X or Y, vertical or uh, horizontal loops, and each one can be either E or M. And these uh, all uh, commute with our, with our underlying Hamiltonian. And we'll see in a moment what these operators are actually useful for. And uh, interestingly, if we have an XM operator, so a, a, a horizontal loop operator of the M particle and a YE operator, a vertical op a, a loop of the E particle, you can check that they actually share just one, one a spin or one bond. Okay, so that's this point over here. And uh, this means that they actually do not commute with each other. Why, why don't they commute with each other? That's because they share just one site, but uh, the uh, a XM operator has a sigma X on that site and the YE operator has a sigma Z. So these two operators uh, uh, would anti-commute. All the other operators in the loop operators would commute. That means that XM actually anti-commutes uh, anti with YE. So what we have 
uh, these, these, uh, this set of loop operators all commute with the Hamiltonian, but they do not commute with each other. And uh, that's very important, as we'll see now, that indicates that the ground state of the system on a, on a torus cannot be unique. There has to be a ground state degeneracy. Let's see in more detail how this ground state degeneracy comes about. So here's our torus, and we have this uh, set of different loop operators. We can have the XM operator or the YE operator, and we can also create a uh, loop, a, a, a vertical loop operator uh, of the M type. So this would be the Y M operator. And all these loop operators all commute with the Hamiltonian, but we, if we have a YE and an XM, they anti-commute because they share a single site. Okay, and uh, a, a, importantly, if we have two Y operators, for instance, YE and YM, they actually commute with each other because uh, they actually do, uh, do, do not have to share a, any site. Um, you can deform these loops around, it won't matter. They might share sites, but they would always share an even number of sites. So uh, uh, no matter how you draw these operators, they would, uh, if, if, the, if there are two vertical loops wise, they would always commute with each other. Okay, so let's uh, imagine somebody gives us a ground state. Okay, so here's uh, a, a ground state of the system. Because of the fact that the two operators YE and YM commute, we can diagonalize both of them and the ground state together. So we can always label our, our ground state according to the eigenvalues of both YE and YM together. So uh, we have written this uh, ground state as AB. What are AB? AB are simply the eigenvalues of YE and YM respectively. Okay, and because both of these operators square to one, these eigenvalues have to be either plus or minus one. So both A, B are just uh, integers which are either plus or minus one. So now let's uh, examine a different state. Okay, so uh, let's uh, take the, the ground state we started from and apply the XM operator on it. So the XM is the uh, horizontal loop of the M particle. Because of the fact that XM commutes with the Hamiltonian, we know that uh, this uh, state, XM times AB, a, is a new ground state. Okay, so it's also a ground state. What, is, uh, a, what we still need to prove is that uh, XM times the state AB is not the same state as AB itself. Okay, so it might be the same state up to a phase, but we want to prove that this is not the case. This is actually a different ground state. And these two ground states are degenerate with, e with each other. How do we prove that? Okay, so what we can show is that uh, if we apply the operator YE to our new state XM times AB, we've actually flipped the eigenvalue of YE from A to minus A. Okay, so uh, why is that? If we apply the operator YE onto the state XM times AB, we can use the fact that YE and XM anti-commute, we get this minus sign, and uh, a, the, is the state AB, by definition, is an eigenstate of the operator YE. So that uh, it pulls out the eigenvalue A. So what we got is that uh, applying YE to this uh, state gives us the same state times minus A. So this means that uh, the state we created is an eigenstate of y, a, a YE with an eigenvalue of minus A. Let's define the state as minus AB. Because of the fact that uh, our, the state we created has a, an opposite eigenvalue of uh, a YE compared to the state we started from, these two states have to be orthogonal to each other. So we've actually created a new ground state. Following the same line of reasoning, you can uh, easily convince yourself that there must be actually four distinct ground states. We can flip either the eigenvalue of A from plus to minus one or a, 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 the B, which is the a, a, a eigenvalue of the operator YM from plus to, plus to minus one. So a, the torus must have at least four ground states. It turns out that they're actually exactly four, four ground states. And uh, this is very interesting. This is actually the uh, advertised topological ground state degeneracy. Okay, so uh, a, the ground state is not unique on the torus. There are four degenerate ground states. And what's interesting is that uh, uh, these ground states are characterized by different eigenvalues of loop operators. In this example, 
It's the YE and YM operators. In particular, that, that indicates that you cannot actually uh, detect or distinguish uh, between these four ground states by doing any local measurement or local perturbation on the system at any point. The only way to know in which ground state you are uh, in is to measure uh, the loop operator uh, which goes all along the system, which is a, a, a very non-local operator. This property makes such a system, a, a topologically ordered system, potentially useful as a quantum memory or a quantum bit. Why is that? Because of the fact that no local operation can detect in which uh, of the different ground states we are in, we can actually store quantum information in uh, this uh, su a ground state subspace. And that uh, a subspace would be totally protected from a noise a, or coupling to the environment because the environment tends to couple to the system by local operators like the density or the spin at some point. So uh, this is a potential route to uh, realizing a fault tolerant qubit. This, this um, a, a idea was proposed by Kitaev. Let me also comment that uh, a, the Tori code model is special. It's an exactly solvable model. As we saw, it's, that's because all the terms in the Hamiltonian commute. If we perturb the, uh, uh, the Hamiltonian slightly with an arbitrary local term, generally the different uh, terms would not commute. And what we'll find is that these uh, four ground states would not be exactly degenerate with each other. They would split, but the splitting would be exponentially small in the system size. The reason for that is that uh, once the different terms in the Hamiltonian don't commute, we can actually create out of the vacuum pairs of either M or E particles. And uh, a pair of, uh, a, of E particles can be created out of the vacuum virtually, a, then tunnel all across the, the loop of the torus and a, a annihilate from the other side. But that type of process, because of the fact that we have a gap, is exponentially suppressed in the um, a, a linear size of the system divided by some correlation length. So uh, when we say a, a topological ground state degeneracy, we usually mean quasi-degeneracy, which is lifted by a, an exponentially small amount in the system size. Finally, I want to discuss the uh, a fractional statistics in the Tori code model. So uh, remember, we started from a, a spin model. Different spins on different sites of the lattice always commute. So spins can always be thought of as bosonic particles. But uh, we'll see that the excitations of the system, which are E and M, have a non-trivial statistics. So for example, suppose we have an M particle somewhere and an E particle somewhere else, and we move the E particle in a closed loop around the M particle. Okay, and we want to ask, what is the uh, a result of this operation? So uh, at the end, the E and M both uh, came back to the same positions, but we'll see that the wave function actually changed by a non-trivial phase. So how do we check the result of this operation? Suppose we start from an E particle somewhere. And let's define an operator that uh, creates a pair of M particles nearby at some finite distance away. So we know exactly how to do this. We saw that applying a string of sigma x operators uh, uh, does the job for us. So that creates an M particle uh, uh, on, on every end of this string. Let's call this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, operator OM. Similarly, we want to define an, a, a, another operator that would move this E in a closed loop around one of the M's. And we know how to do that as well. We simply uh, create a string of sigma Z operators on a closed loop. So that would uh, actually uh, move this E particle around in a closed loop and return it to the original position. We'll call this operator OE. Now what we can do is apply the OE op a, a, a operator either before or after we apply the OM. If we first apply the, apply the OM, there is an M particle inside this loop and the E particle went in a closed loop around it. If we, uh, on the other hand, if we first applied the E operator, there was no M particle inside the loop when the uh, E particle traveled around the loop and uh, there was no a, a winding of E around M going on. And because of the fact that the OM and the OE share exactly one site, and uh, uh, the OM has a sigma X there, and the OE has a sigma Z, you can easily check that these two operators anti-commute. You pick exactly one minus sign when you exchange them, 
because of the sigma z and the sigma x on that one shared site. So uh, uh, this fact means that the difference between taking an E in a closed loop with or without an M particle inside is one minus sign, one overall phase of pi. Notice nicely how uh, this uh, uh, anti-commutation uh, 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 relation holds independently of how you define the overall phase of the, o and, uh, uh, the uh, OE and OM operators. So this implies that taking an E particle in a closed loop around an M particle actually results in an a overall phase of pi, or a global phase of minus one. So uh, this is referred to as mutual statistics. So we have two different kinds of uh, quasi-particles. In this example, the E and the M quasi particles. So uh, if we just exchange their positions, we wouldn't get back to the same state because these are two different, uh, different particles. But we can take the E particle in a complete closed loop around the M particle, then we should go back to the same state and the result is an overall non-trivial phase of minus one. So this is called the, a, a fractional a, a, a mutual statistics between the E and the M. Now you can create a third type of quasi-particle, which is the composite of one a E particle and one M particle. So if you, uh, if you have two of these particles close by, you can think about them as sort of a bound state, a, a composite particle which is cr a, a created out of both. This is a, a new type of quasi-particle referred to as the epsilon particle. And now you can take two of these epsilon particles, two composites of E and M. These are now two identical particles and you can simply exchange their positions. Now you should return to the same state up to a phase. And I won't go into the details, the, uh, uh, this is done in, in the uh, uh, accompanying note, but you can check that uh, the result of this exchange is actually also an overall minus one. So uh, this uh, composite particle made out of, uh, a, 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 of a fusion of an E particle and an M particle is actually a fermion. Okay, so I just wanted to um, uh, appreciate this fact. We started from a model of spins, there were no fermions around, and the excitations of this uh, model behave as if they're fermions. This is uh, an example of fractional statistics. So just to summarize this video, we discussed a topological order uh, generally, and we saw the Tori code model, which is perhaps the simplest example of this uh, phenomenon. It's characterized by the presence of uh, a fractionalized statistics and a non-trivial ground state degeneracy on the torus. The Tori code realizes what we called a, a, what we call an a abelian topologically ordered phase. Why is it abelian? Because the result of exchanging two particles is an overall phase and, and, uh, diff and phases commute with each other. So if we exchange different pairs of particles, these operations would always commute. Interestingly, there are also a, a more exotic and more fascinating topologically ordered phases that are non-abelian. What are non-abelian states? This would be discussed at length in the rest of this uh, part of the course. I'll just give you a quick preview. In non-abelian states, the uh, degeneracy of an excited state grows exponentially with the number of excitations or quasi-particles that you create. And therefore, if you exchange two of these particles, the result doesn't have to be a phase. It can be uh, a described by a unitary matrix acting on this uh, degenerate subspace. And because of the fact that unitary matrices don't necessarily commute, for instance, if you exchange one and two, you get a matrix U12, then you can exchange two and three, you get U23. These two matrices don't have to commute. And this is why this uh, type of state is called the non-abelian state. You already saw an example of such a state, the Moreed state, which uh, is realized in the fractional quantum hole systems in a filling factor of five halves. There's, in a, a, there's a, a different a fascinating example also due to Kitaev, which is a spin model on the honeycomb lattice, and that would be the topic of the next video.